Hello, everybody. This is Teresa Schumard with the American Sleep Apnea Association, and I'm very happy to see all of you here today. Welcome. Um, before we get started, we're going to go to the next slide, and we'll have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Next slide, please. So, if you have questions during the webinar, and if you are listening to us live today, you can type your questions into the chat box that you'll see on your your uh, screen at any time, and we can go over those questions at the end of the webinar as time allows. Um, and we may have an open mic session near the end if if time allows. In, in during that time period, we would love to hear from you. It's not mandatory, of course, but if you if you would like to say something, we would be happy to hear you, uh, whether it's a question or a comment. Uh, we'd love to have you take part. Now, if you're listening to the recorded version of the webinar, uh, which we have up on our website, after this session is over, um, you can always email your questions to asaa at sleepapnea.org. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. We don't have too many vocabulary words today. There are, um, I may add some later to the the slides, uh, but I think that, you know, this is going to get us through. A lot of the words are a little more complicated than um, I'm used to using for a patient webinar, but, uh, I, and I don't want that to scare you off uh, or bore you, so I'm going to kind of skim over some of those and just try to use plainer um, language. But we will talk about uh, CSF, which is cerebrospinal fluid, which is a colored, colorless, clear body fluid around the brain and the spinal cord. It acts as a cushion or buffer for brain and basically providing a mechanical and immunological protection to the brain inside the skull. And then we have a test that I'm sure that everybody's heard of, but uh, it is an fMRI, which means functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's a test that uh, MRI, you usually hear it, referred to as uh, a test that br uh, measures the brain activity by detecting changes in the associated uh, blood flow. And the technique relies on the fact that cerebral, cerebral blood flow and neuronal activation are coupled. Okay, next slide, please. When, I want to know, did bragging about one's sleep debt become a thing. Uh, we talk about sleep as if it's an inconvenience or an obstacle when getting obstacle to getting work done in the United States especially. Uh, we wear our exhaustion like a badge of honor we won for doing more, you know, sacrificing more, caring more than those who chose to sleep. Well, we had more important things to do. I think everybody knows someone like that. Um, and we have, in the United States especially, have a, a crazy long list of priorities, and sleep is at the bottom. Um, some people believe that they're getting enough sleep at only four to five hours a night, but science tells us otherwise. This isn't about the things beyond our control, like having to wake up in the morning and going to work. But there are many legitimate reasons why the average American adult clocks only about six and three quarters 
hours of sleep during the work week. Um, However, the fact that so many of us actively deny ourselves sleep and then with the machismo bravado boast about that fact is symptomatic of a broader American dysfunction in how we prioritize productivity and self-denial over the necessities of like eating, physical and mental play, relaxing and sleeping. Just look at our friend Bill here. (laughs) He actually used to sleep under his desk and just take, you know, little naps when he was building his company, his little company. <laughs> Next slide, please. I guess I guess that, uh, you know, you have to wonder, you know, if he hadn't of <laughs> where we would be um, today. Certainly there were others. All right. Uh, we have... Uh, the term short sleeper, and it really is a a classification of people. Um, And sure, it it does happen that some people can function on less sleep. There was a a discovery of a genetic mutation that appears to allow what are termed as the short sleepers. And a handful of transgenic mice You know, who truly do need less sleep? But it leaves us wondering, what is happening to their brains over the long haul? Um, These images are clockwise from the top left. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, former, the late, uh, Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci, American founding father Ben Franklin, and theoretical physicist Albert Einstein, We could be here all day having a spirited discussion on the similarities of their genius-level intelligence and how that might be linked to the short sleeper phenomenon, but they are all reported to possess, or so the stories go, that uh, they only slept a little here and there. Most adults need seven or more hours of sleep per night and are unable to function well after less than six hours of nightly sleep. Short sleepers regularly do feel alert and refreshed after getting less than six hours, and they function normally, surprisingly. Um, The limited sleep duration occurs naturally for a short sleeper, and it's not a forced attempt to re- to restrict themselves or to avoid stre- sleep, um, the low amount of sleep that they get from night to night is the same. It appears on weekends and holidays. Now, short sleeping is different from insomnia. Next slide, please. We certainly have to feel for anyone that suffers from insomnia uh, for the various reasons that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But for uh, insomniacs, uh, they have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. We've all had this from time to time in life. Uh, But the overall quality of their sleep may be poor. Uh, In contrast, the short sleepers have no complaints about sleep problems, and the quality of their sleep also tends to be good. Uh, Now, we'll look at at the right side, uh, or the left side, I'm sorry, uh, overwork, the, the deliberate restriction of sleep versus insomnia. It would be overworking, burning the candle at both ends, doing a lot of gaming, whether it be online or, um, you know, at uh, places, uh, off-track betting type places. Social media addiction, binge watching, I don't want to say the name, but Netflix, <laughs> and, and those kinds of venues. Seasons and seasons and seasons, and, and we are encouraged to do this. This is the new normal. 
Um, and so you get so caught up in, and I've done it, you know, you get so caught up in the um, the show, you know, and wanting to see the next installment that, you know, you will stay up beyond what you should stay awake for and, and then be uh, uh, very sleep deprived the next day. So if we look at insomnia, uh, the complications from insomnia, we have the psychological, the lower performance, slowed reaction time, risk of depression, risk of anxiety disorder, uh, overweight, or obesity. We have poor immune system function, high blood pressure, risk of heart failure, risk of diabetes, and more and more uh, we're getting scientific data that states that these are definitely linked. Now, there's a huge difference between deliberately restricting your sleep and having insomnia, of course, but although the consequences of lack of sleep are the same on the suffering body and, of course, the brain, so we we have to really wonder what's going on here with, you know, with people that, you know, is it is it a... Is it something that it's learned? Is it something that, you know, I mean, being it's deliberate, you you have to wonder if society is not just a big, huge part of that. Next slide, please, Sean. So some people just cannot get adequate sleep, uh, you know, under the umbrella of insomnia. You know, they they may have anxieties to severe point, uh, work-related stress, depression, family or marital problems, divorce. I mean, certainly these are huge issues uh, for one to handle. And sometimes uh, sleep is just not coming. A loved one that has a terminal disease, I can see that that would be totally uh, a reason to uh, not be able to sleep. Maybe you're a caregiver or the person is a caregiver of someone with an acute illness. Maybe someone they love has passed. And then, of course, we have the parents of newborns worrying about the child. Not, I mean, yes, okay, you know, they're they're not getting much sleep because the baby is crying at different hours and this and that. But some parents are just very nervous about having a baby and a newborn in the house, especially a first born, uh, their firstborn. So, you know, this lends itself to to that. So, you know, although not much can be done to change these burdens in life, sometimes understanding the nuances about the reasons for the inability to achieve sleep may make a difference in actually getting some sleep. Next slide, please. Now, this is just a simple little exercise. I want everybody to please remember. Let's try it now, if you like, um, how you might be able to use this to be able to fall asleep if you're having a difficult time getting to sleep. Um, just ex exhale through your mouth. Get rid of all the air. And inhale through the nose for four seconds. So inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold your breath for seven counts. Now exhale slowly through the mouth for eight counts. And repeat. That will definitely relax you. And it's free. No drugs needed. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. The consequences of inadequate sleep, uh, wow, road rage, biggie. <laughs> that if you've ever seen road rage, it's very, very alarming. Uh, people with inadequate sleep have a poor disposition many times. They get into arguments. They'll experience road rage. 
and sadly, drowsy driving accidents. They get behind the wheel, you know, making poor decisions, poor driving skills, following cars too closely, missing road signs, yawning, nodding off sometimes. Maybe you, oh, they cannot recall the last few miles they've driven. This is as dangerous as driving drunk. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that up to 6,000 fatal crashes each year may be caused by drowsy drivers. And that number goes up all the time, uh, up and down. But I think mostly goes up. Uh, I think maybe, you know, we saw a slight decline in in the years that awareness was being raised. It just wasn't something that was talked about. It was drunk driving that got really all the press. But it is just as dangerous to drive drowsy. Drowsy driving accidents make up 21% of all fatal crashes. Total, there are 338,000 crashes a year. That's non-fatal and fatal crashes. Next slide, please. When you're sleep deprived, you don't always take care of yourself. You may not, you know, be looking your best, which sometimes with the, with the disposition factor coming in, you may not be approachable. And uh, folks, <laughs> beauty sleep is a legitimate thing. And it was a small study that was published uh, just a couple of years ago in the journal Sleep that found that sleep-deprived study participants were rated as less attractive and sadder. Um, there was a different study in Stockholm, Sweden, that found that exhausted people are also judged to be less approachable. And the problem only gets worse from there. Um, the researchers have also linked chronic sleep deprivation with skin aging. So if you see somebody that's in their 70s and they have nice baby skin, you know that they probably have had good sleep their whole life. Next slide, please. Now you can actually put, I, I would like for you to do that, uh, locate with your hand as the the boy in the picture is doing these are just i mean not that you're going to be able to feel the lobes but this is where they're located and uh the frontal lobe of the brain the occipital lobe the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe next slide please this is uh just a view of the temporal and frontal lobes from above and the location of the lobes can be te detected by measuring the head via something that is called the 1020 International Electrode Placement System. Next slide, please. Uh, don't get too caught up in this complicated looking piece here, but this it, it, it is how the the brain is measured, and it's most it should be able to do testing, let's say, for instance, your sleep study. It's the most uh, widely used method to place electrodes relative to the underlying area of the cerebral cortex. You may feel that this is rather daunting, but all those letters on the slide, when, is, when they are measured out, correspond to brain lobe areas precisely. And the 10 and the 20 refer to a 10% and a 20% percent interelectrode difference. So for our purposes of identifying and discussing the various regions of the brain during this webinar, the 1020 system is helpful. And like I said, if you have a sleep study, you know, the 1020 system was likely used on you. Next slide, please. Now we're not going to we're not going to dwell too much on the parts of the brain. I just want you to be aware of you know where things happen, where things are coming from, and uh, the impacts of sleep deprivation. Um, this is the inferior frontal gyros, and it is or gyros. It 
negative effects include the the wit of a person being impaired. Divergent thinking is lessened and cognitive functioning is marred. Uh, when you're skimping on sleep, it's a clever commentary. You may not follow so easily, but sleep loss affects uh, cognitive processes like divergent thinking, which helps us switch topics nimbly during a conversation. So if not rested, this is not an easy task. Uh, scientists have found that the inferior frontal gyros increases when sleep-deprived people tried to list uses for different objects, suggesting that the brain draws on divergent thinking to compensate for strained cognitive functioning. Next slide, please. The medial and prefrontal cortex, the negative effects for their anger. Uh, focus on negative experiences, misinterpret facial expressions. I'm sorry, uh, next slide, please, Sean. Uh, it's anger, and the sleep loss pr is primes us to focus on negative experiences, misinterpret facial expressions, and even pick fights. Uh, emotional volatility may partly be a product of inner interrupted communication between brain regions. The fMRI of a well-rested brain shows connectivity between the amygdala, which is a system structure critical to emotional processing, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which helps re us regulate feelings. Um, sleep deprivation cuts this connection, letting your revved up amygdala and your mood run wild. Next slide, please. Hallucinations. Uh, the well-rested brain filters stimuli, noise, light, smell, to separate what matters from what doesn't matter and prevent sensory overload. Uh, when the brain can't filter this information coming in, you have chaos. So after pulling an all-nighter, people may begin to anticipate things that aren't there, including objects. And oh, so woolly boogers. So next slide, please. You may feel you know, head in the clouds uh, and a false memory feeling going on. And you know, we all lose focus from time to time, but brain activity is linked to attention lapses and it changes when people sacrifice sleep. After a good night's sleep, these lapses correspond to filtered thalamus function, less active frontal and parietal networks, which basically means we tune out when we're bored. But when sleep-deprived people space out, they also exhibit impaired visual sensory processing, suggesting that the whole other level of disengagement with the world is, is happening. Simply put, you know, losing sleep turns you into Edith from all in the family. <laughs> so next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No, same slide. False memories of uh, the sleep-starved brain may fail to encode memories successful in the first place thanks to the hi hippocampus as well as the prefrontal cortex cortex, and parietal lobe regions. One study has found that people are more likely to incorporate misinformation into memories of events observed after a night without sleep. Next slide, please. Cerebral shrinkage, slurred speech, and binging. Um, healthy adults getting poor sleep lose volume in the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. And researchers don't yet understand if sleep loss causes shrinkage or vice versa. Uh, researchers don't uh, understand about the slurred speech sometimes. Uh, the temporal lobe, the brain region associated with language processing, is actually highly active in well-rested people but inactive in their exhausted and enunciation-challenged counterparts. 
binging, uh, there you go. That's the activity in the frontal lobe. It controls decision-making and more activity in the amygdala, a key player. Together, these neural changes create a brain mechanism that dulls judgment and ratchets up desire. The ideal mindset for scarfing down uh, a fistful of donuts or bacon. (laughs) Next slide, please. Brain damage and risky decisions. Um, When sleep-deprived people prepare to make economic decisions, the brain's reward center in the prefrontal cortex lights up, suggesting they may expect to win. Maybe money. (laughs) When uh, the risky choices don't pan out, people's brain activity decreases in that region related to punishment and aversion and suggests that they don't care about losing money as much as they would on a good night's sleep. And brain damage, add all-nighters to the list of things that kills brain cells. In this case, the brain stem. The damage may may be irreparable and making up uh, a catch-up on lost sleep is a poor excuse for snoozing until noon on the weekends. Next slide, please. The brain sweeps clean of toxins during sleep. And while the brain is sleeping, it clears out these harmful toxins, a process that may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, researchers say. Um, During sleep, the flow of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain increases dramatically, washing away waste proteins that build up between brain cells during the waking hours. A study of mice uh, proved this. It's it's like a dishwasher uh, effect. Uh, The results of the study offer offer the best explanation yet of why animals and people need sleep. If this proves to be true in humans as well, it could be a helpful explanation to the uh, mysterious association between sleep disorders and brain diseases, including Alzheimer's. A team of scientists discovered the cleaning process while studying the brains of those sleeping mice we mentioned above. They noticed that during sleep, the system that circulates cerebrospinal fluid through the brain and the nervous system was pumping fluid into the brain and removing fluid from the brain at a very rapid pace. Um, The team discovered that this increased flow was possible in part because when mice went to sleep, their brain cells actually shrank making it easier for fluid to circulate. So when an animal, an animal woke up, the brain stem cells enlarged again and the flow between cells slowed to a trickle. And it was almost like opening and closing a faucet. Very dramatic, uh, said Dr. Uh, Niedergaard, was the chief investigator on this study. Um, Niedergaard's team had previously shown that this fluid was carrying away waste products that build up in the spaces between the brain cells. And this was about a decade ago. Um, The process is important because what's getting washed away during sleep are waste proteins that are toxic to brain cells. This could explain why we don't think clearly after a sleepless night and why a prolonged lack of sleep can actually kill an animal or a person. Um, Next, uh, no, we're still on the same slide, I'm sorry, Sean. The report also offers a tantalizing hint of a new approach to Alzheimer's uh, prevention And it does raise the possibility that one might be able to actually control sleep in a way to improve the clearance of uh, beta amyloid and help prevent amyloidosis that we think can lead to Alzheimer's. Next slide. So cerebrospinal fluid that we've been talking about 
Um, let's look at this for a minute. We talked about it earlier, but many conditions can be detected in, in the CSF, including infection of the membrane surrounding the brain and the spinal cord, which gets you a meningitis diagnosis, uh, bleeding, sub, subarachnoid hemorrhage or stroke, viral infection, which would be encephalitis, tumors, lymphoma, and cancer, autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis. The lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap, can help diagnose serious infections such as meningitis and other disorders of the central nervous system, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome and MS, or cancers of the brain or spinal cord. While the primary function of the CSF is to cushion the brain within the skull and serve as a shock absorber for the central nervous system, CSF also circulates nutrients and chemicals filtered from the blood and removes waste products from the brain. Examining the fluid can be useful in diagnosing many, many diseases. Next slide, please. This is just a diagram. I'm not going to go into this very much of the paravascular pathway, um, also known as the glymphatic pathway. And it was recently, uh, the recently described system for waste clearance in the brain. It allows for the intimate exchange involved in the delivery of nutrients to the brain and waste clearance, and it's likely that the pathway also contributes to the distribution of other growth factors, neuromodulators, carrier proteins, and nutrients. Additionally, it might serve as a useful pathway for drug delivery to the brain. Future studies investigating the forces be, uh, driving fluid flow through the paravascular pathway are expected very, very actually have uh, begun and have ensued in the last few years. That is the end of our presentation for today. But I did want to, next slide please, Sean. I did want to um, open the mic up. Is Carl here? I would like for Carl if and everyone else is unmuted, so if you have um if you have something noisy going on in the background, please uh just sort of mute your phone. Uh well, if you're in a noisy place. But Carl, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay. Would you want to talk about this study, please? For the overlap? Yes. Yeah, we're doing a um, collaboration. I diagnosed with apnea, and we're going to open up recruitment in in approximately um, a week, um, maybe a little bit later. And it's going to be a completely online um, program where people can sign up online and, and the interventions carried out online. So if you're over 40, have both disorders, and are, are prescribed a CPAP machine, um, you can learn more on the Overlap website. Thank you. That is Dr. Stepnowski, our principal investigator. The next slide talks about where you can get some more information at ASAA at sleepapnea.org. And next slide, please. This is talking about another study. And I am so boldly promoting these during the webinar because without research, we're, we can't improve in medicine and so I figure that you know since we have a, a an audience of people 
that are interested in good health that this might be a uh, a nice audience to talk to this about. Um, if you would like to go over this one, either Carl or Sean. Yeah, sure. I can I can jump in. This is a uh, we were really excited because what we want to be doing is patient centered research. In fact, um, um, looking at a survey we put out because we we surveyed our community to try to find out what um, topics are of interest. What the Sleep Health Mobile App Study represents is is really a, a patient design study where um, we were looking to learn more about the association between nighttime sleep and daytime functioning but by doing it using a mobile app. So this way we can move the, the quote unquote, the sleep laboratory right into, into our pockets. And um, what it is, you can go to the, unfortunately it's only open to folks with iPhones or iPods, and the app is available on the Apple App Store. Um, we're looking to, to expand that, but for now it's, it's limited to, to folks with an iPhone who have um, access to the App Store. Uh, you download the study. There's an e-consent module where you can learn about the study um, and get going right away. So if anyone's interested um, or has any questions, the information's up there. You can either email us or, or call us about it or <coughs> the App Store, download it, and, and, and take advantage of it. Um, we have a news feed inside of there, but we're always looking for feedback on both this study and any other studies, so feel free to contact us there if you have other interesting research ideas on how we can improve this one or, or do other ones. We're really trying to serve our community. Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe, it may be, uh, you don't have the overlap syndrome, but maybe you know someone that does, and in that case, Please let them know about it because um, it's a. I mean, it's it's not so rare, but um, it is it is a challenge. I think sometimes for people coming forward and and finding these types of uh, studies. I believe uh, you know. I believe that research is very important, and in, in well, I don't have to tell. You guys, you, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, next slide, please. So, and next slide, please. Do we have any questions? I guess we can open up the floor and see if anybody would like to talk to us. I can kind of, if no one has any direct questions right away, just to help generate some discussion, I can kind of share um, a, a story about my own sleep evolution over time. And it actually kind of, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that glymphatic system because it's really a fascinating find over the last few years. I mean, historically, we really didn't, you know, going back 10 years ago, when you ask a, a sleep researcher or a sleep clinician, why do we sleep? Um, all you would get are, were some theories on, on maybe why. And over the last 10 years, we've really learned a lot more about why sleep is so important for memory consolidation, for rejuvenation, for basically what we learned with the glymphatic system is cleaning out toxins from, from the brain. Um, but I'll, I'll get more to the glymphatic system. I just wanted to talk a little bit. I remember going back to the slide on deliberate sleep restriction. So when I was a college freshman, I thought the best time to study was between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. <laughs> and I was very lucky uh, very early in sophomore year. Uh, my grades were awful first year. And so I was very lucky to take a course called the Psychophysiology of Sleep and Dreams. And it was really funny because I thought I'd learned more about dreams, but instead it was a completely a, a course solely focused on the physiology of sleep. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so boring. You know, what do we need to learn about sleep for? And then I read this article that said that folks who get a, a, a good full night's sleep can can learn better and have higher academic performance. And I, I looked at my grades and I looked at this study and I said, well, maybe uh, studying between 12 and 3 a.m. isn't the best idea. And I remember thinking that my brain was not sticky. And I, I remember that specifically because I could read the same paragraph three and four times and it just oh. was not registering. So 
so I immediately changed my sleep habits. Start. It was very hard in college to go to bed at, at 11 p.m., but I'd, I'd be in bed by 11 and start studying in the morning. And boy, if my grades, I got straight A's the entire sophomore year, and I really attribute <laughs> it to the change in, in sleep. So that's why now when we look ahead to some of the recent findings from what we're learning about the glymphatic system, and you know when we talk to folks who are chronically sleep deprived, one of the, the best phrases I've heard is brain fog. I feel like I'm in a fog. You know, I, I'm just not clear. And we, we're starting to learn the physiological reasons, and, and the physiological reason is below our necks, our, our body's waste removal system is the lymphatic system, and it's an amazing system because it gets rid of all the body toxins. The problem is it doesn't serve the brain. And so the brain needs to have this entirely separate system called the glymphatic system, and the glymphatic system is there for waste removal. And, in, and the fascinating thing about it is, and the reason why it's relevant to, to this topic specifically, is because the glymphatic system only works when we're asleep. It doesn't, it's really turned down when we're awake. So um, it really speaks to the importance of, of sleep. And really, um, the other important aspect of that is um, there used to be a concept called sleep debt, and, and a lot of folks think that they can kind of incur sleep debt and then eventually pay off sleep debt. And that's not necessarily the case. It's, what's really important is getting the proper amount of sleep in a 24-hour period, um, not necessarily depriving ourselves for five days and then catching up on, on two days. So we're learning a lot more about uh, sleep and functioning and, and how to be well um, through sleep. Well, I have a confession to make, Dr. Carl. Mm -hmm. I didn't sleep last night except two hours getting uh -huh. ready for this presentation. So I, I think that you heard me searching for my words, and uh, I definitely am sleep deprived today. And <laughs> it, 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 I, it, I just had a busy day yesterday, and I couldn't get to everything. And I needed to have this done for today, and duty calls, and boy... My eyelids even hurt. I mean, my eyelashes <laughs> are, you know, everything hurts. So I'm definitely, definitely not doing this again. I say that every time that I do. I, you know, I was a sleep tech for many years and was used to staying up at night and yada, yada. And, oh, I'm more, you know, you know, productive but that's not true. I mean, I guess if you sleep all day and then you are awake at night, but I never really did feel uh, that well rested even at that. So, uh, but I think it's it was something that I got used to. It's a bad habit, bad, bad, bad. So I'm I'm trying to uh, practice what I preach from now on. I I say this. I know I say this to you guys a lot. <laughs> But I, 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 I'm here sometimes, and I see everybody else is sleeping because no one is lighting up on the computer, and you know, and I'm like, oh, I want to sleep too. <laughs> but uh, it's okay though because I am fairly elderly, so. I, you know. <laughs> no, that's a great but, example of what happens with with sleep deprivation. That, that's mm -hmm. that's a cool example. Absolutely. Yeah. So I didn't want to. I needed to confess that. Now I feel better. Yeah. So, <laughs> do we have any other comments or questions? No. We'd love to hear other people's experiences. Oh, we do. We love it. And, Speak and... up. Don't be afraid. We can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> How about how about you now, Carl? Don't you don't you keep a pretty steady bedtime? Oh yeah. Well, what what I learned then in, in hindsight, high school through college, I, I thought I was a major insomniac. And then as we learned more about delayed sleep phase syndrome, looking back on it, I was probably just a typical adolescent who was trying to go to sleep at ten, but the body just wasn't ready. And so I think it was a mixture of, of both. But because I always attributed it more to insomnia, 
um, I just learned ways to be really in tune with my um, signs of sleep. So I paid attention to um, the lighting in the room, the bedtime routine, kind of winding down, making to-do lists, everything to reduce stress and, and the um, rumination that happens in bed. And so now I consider myself a professional sleeper. I, I do all the right things and put my head down, and pretty much five minutes later, I'm I'm asleep. Mm-hmm. And I try you know, to. Do I that. remember getting also used try to, be to very sleeping. regular too. Yeah, ten ten to six. Although now with the consumer sleep devices, it's been great because I I wasn't using them for quite a while. A couple of years went by, and I said, Oh yeah, I'm still a seven seven and a half hour sleeper. And I noticed with time that I'm down to you know six six and a half hours. And it's it's a little bit hard to get more than that. It doesn't affect the functioning, but it's really interesting to take a closer look at total sleep duration, which is, has slowly gone down as, as age increases. Well, if we have no other questions, we probably can. Uh, we're at 12.46, so Eastern time. So we Anybody, any go. questions or comments? Yeah. We're wide open here. A good, good presentation. Thank you. Sure. Oh, thank you for coming. Is that John? That's me. Hi. I'm home today with the awful flu that's going around. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> There's a sleep depriver right there. Yeah. Totally. You know, before this this um, talk, and sorry, Teresa, I'm, I'm so busy with, with other stuff, I wanted to take a quick look at the relationship between poor sleep and susceptibility to colds and flu. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was some great research um, in the field of psychoneuroimmunology where they were actually testing um, people who slept well and then sleep deprived them and exposed them, it was some research out of the University of Rochester, I think it was, Mm -hmm. and exposed them to the cold, to the cold virus. And they did find that people who were sleep deprived were more susceptible. Um, Numbers weren't earth shattering, but but it was interesting to see, because I know during the flu season, like I, I try to get as much regular sleep as possible. And I do notice if there's some kind of stressor or you know, something going on where my sleep really is lacking, maybe a you know, few nights of insomnia, I do feel more susceptible. And, you know, it'd be really yeah. interesting to take a quick look at the, not saying that that's the cause, it's, you know, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's increasing susceptibility. Yeah, anecdotally, I find the same. Do you? Yeah. You know, and, and modern medicine hasn't found a cure for the cold yet, and this flu strain is just getting worse and worse, it seems like, each mm-hmm. year. And while the the vaccines yeah, this are... This has really been bad. This has been the worst flu I've, well, I've had in quite a few years. Uh, the body aches and the headaches and the chills and sweats. It's, it's really knocked me down this week. Really? Yeah. And then it probably affects the quality of your sleep, too, right? So even once you yeah, have so it... That's, yeah, it's, it's like a vicious a vicious cycle, uh, and it just makes it that much harder to get out of it. Um, so I, I noticed last night my sleep was, was not very good, um, and I just feel that much worse today. And I feel some of the symptoms, uh, which have seem to be improving now, all of a sudden are not. Right. Do you find that you rest or, or even nap um, when you have, have the flu or the cold? Yeah, this I, I, I'm not normally much of a napper. Um, but uh, this one was so bad uh, that I did uh, spend a number of hours sleeping during the day over the past uh, five days, um, which you know, feels good at the time, but then throws my sleep cycle off uh, because then I wind up laying awake half the night. And then we just get into this blur between daytime drowsiness and, and napping and nighttime grogginess and <laughs> insomnia and it, that that whole cycle takes you know, itself takes a while to kick out, even even absent flu symptoms. Right. Yeah. Great description. It looks like somebody was typing a question, but I can't pull it up. Oh, is the app. Thanks for pointing that out. Is this app available for Android? Can it be synced with Fitbit data? 
Yeah, no, uh, the answer to the first part of the question is unfortunately no, it's not available for Android at this time. Um, we're looking to develop that or to make it available um, via the web, but it's not available yet. Um, and then the second part of the question is, can it be synced with Fitbit data? And yeah, the most recent version that we um, just released about a month ago uh, does allow um, consumer wearables to be incorporated into the app. But there's a specific way to do it, and that is the wearable data needs to be able to be um, shared directly to Apple's health app. Um, if it's shared to Apple's health app, then when you sign up for our research study, you just allow um, sharing of data from Apple Health to the Sleep Health mobile app study. Um, so there, Apple Health is kind of an intermediary between any of the objective sleep uh, monitors and the research study. That's a great question. Um, the um, same person asked uh, the following, would you recommend using a UV or happy lamp in the morning to help regulate your body to what is daytime for people in areas where the sun doesn't ri rise until later in the day? And that's, that's a great, great question. In fact, this person must have seen what I did this morning, which was my daughter's uh, 15 years old, and, and she and most of her friends are suffering with, with waking up and being alert in the morning. So I said, I wonder if the iPhone, um, the iPhone uh, flashlight is bright enough. To <laughs> so yeah, I shined it in her eyes this morning on the way to work, because in San Diego we're having a winter storm and it's very dark outside. Um, so we were laughing. But in all seriousness, um, using a, a bright light can be very helpful in, in the morning, especially in areas where um, the sun is either rising late or it's impacted by, by clouds. Oh, Teresa or John, if you guys want to add more. It's a, absolutely yeah. almost a necessity living in Seattle for people. Um, I think a, a lot of people use it and are happy with it. Some people even use it at their desks right. at work. Right. Um, a um, colleague over at the, the Scripps Clinic gave a, a great talk on delayed sleep phase in adolescence uh, a couple months ago here at UCSD. And, and while a lot of school systems are starting to move start times later to accommodate, he made a suggestion which I wanted to look into more, which was what if classrooms outfitted their um, the lights with, with essentially bright lights or full spectrum lights mm -hmm. to help our adolescents um, adjust their, their phase maybe a, a little bit better than, than they are. Mm -hmm. So um, that can have a, a, a great effect, I think. Um, for, for people. I think you do have to be careful. It has to be a full spectrum light. It just can't um, occupy a portion of the light spectrum. So that's a, an important aspect to it. That's probably a topic worthy of a, of a webinar of its own. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, I grew up on Eastern and Long Island. We'd have some longer winters, and, and I had some family members who I wondered if they, you know, in hindsight, I mean, as, as a kid, you don't necessarily know, but seasonal affective disorder. And, you know, um, at least a few said, you know, come, come the middle, late January, early February, they just were going stir crazy and, you know, just, and, and I, now I recommend it to those same family members when it's that dark for that long, Please seriously consider bright light therapy. Now I have one of those that's uh, here in the corner of my room. It's very bright, and I can I turn it on and aim it at the ceiling, and it kind of fills the whole room with that all band, uh, all spectrum light. I, I do like it. I use it during the day, but I also make sure to turn it off once the sun goes down. The other thing I do uh, to try to uh, prevent us. Uh, sleep loss um, from exposure to uh, to uh, cathode ray tubes and, and uh, devices and whatnot as I'm starting to use um, the applications that are available on the iOS devices uh, and on my PC screens, which start to change the uh, screen colors to eliminate the blue light. 
and turn it more into reds and browns and oranges, right. um, which kind of is supposed to <clears throat> prevent loss of melatonin secretion. Uh, I've been uh, using that for quite a while. Uh, if you're going to do, begin doing any screen time after dark. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Mm-hmm. There's a app, free application called F. Lux. I think I'll post it on the um, uh, sleep apnea um, website uh, where you can get it for free. But it's something you can load onto your PCs, and it, it uses the um, system clock to uh, change the color of your screens to the appropriate levels as the day changes. And I, I live in Portland, so we go through a lot of a lot of gray days. In fact, it's doing that to us right now. Right. Mm-hmm. Thank you, John. Yeah, and, and for folks who are on, on the phone who might have um, an iPhone, you're right, with iOS, I believe it's under um, Display and Brightness. It's a feature called Night Shift, and you can actually program yeah. it at time, so it's just, it just automatically happens. It's not something you have to do manually. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's the one for iOS. I remember when I was learning to sleep in the daytime as a, as a night shift technician. Um, boy, I just couldn't I couldn't get used to it. I couldn't sleep in the daytime, no matter how tired I was. And um, you know, the light, you know, from the windows, any any little thing. So I I went through everything. I put aluminum foil on the windows and then I would try and sleep and I'd see one little crack that I missed and I'd have to get up and and fix that and finally I woke up to the fact that there were these great sleep masks that I could use Mm. and um and it's really it was really sad because in my neighborhood I had a guy that had just retired and he waited for one blade of grass to get taller than the others. And he was out there, you know, mowing, mowing, mowing. And it was hard to sleep. And once I put the mask on, I was able to get into a deep enough sleep before he started his mowing. And then I was I was good to go. Then I was good and asleep. So I, I totally... Uh, recommend that for night shift people. Yeah. Well, we are near the top of the hour, so I, if there are, is it, does anyone else have a question? Oh, well, if not, well, thank you for coming, everyone. Our next webinar is on the 24th of the month. It's a Wednesday also at noon Eastern time. And the title of that webinar is Demystifying Sleep Research Results. So uh, hopefully we can talk about some practical and uh, friendly uses and and terms to understand and uh, understand research. It's such an important part of of, uh, medicine. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sean. And we will see you next time on American Sleep Apnea Association webinars on Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.